Welcome to the session live, a recap of the 2023 legislature. This show is produced as a partnership between the nonprofit newsrooms of Montana Free Press, Montana Public Radio, and Yellowstone Public Radio. On Mondays, over the last four months, we've brought you reporting on the politics and policy inside the Montana State House. Now that lawmakers are done with their work, we're going to offer some of our takeaways and answer your questions about the 68th legislature. I'm Corin Cates Carney. I'm the news director at Montana Public Radio, and I'll be your host this evening. We've got a round table of reporters here to answer your questions, and you can submit those. There's an ask a question button at the bottom of your screen, so you can send those there. Let's uh, introduce our team of journalists, and uh, maybe team of journalists, you can uh, introduce yourself and maybe say what you've been up to or uh, what you're doing now that the session's over. Mara, let's start with you. Hey everybody, I'm Mara Silvers. I cover Health and Human Services with Montana Free Press. Um, just before I joined this call, I was in my garden, gardening, planting some vegetables. Um, so that was that's maybe one of the bright spots of having a post-session life. And I think my dog appreciates me not being at the Capitol all day, every day as well. Eric, let's go to you. Um, I'm Eric Dietrich. I'm a reporter and editor at Montana Free Press. And continuing the theme of outdoor stuff, I have a shed in my backyard that is falling over and needs attention. So, uh, yeah. Aaron? Yeah, and I'm Aaron Kimball Sanit. I'm also with the Montana Free Press. Um, I'm a renter, so I'm not doing any of that stuff. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I'm hanging out with friends and I'm about to go on vacation, so that's nice. Shaley? Yeah, I'm Shaylee Rager. Um, I'm the State House reporter for Montana Public Radio. And I was kind of hoping like the news cycle would slow down a little bit, like we'd get a little break, but there's already been a couple of lawsuits and we're already looking to to news that is coming. But I'm also trying to to get outside. If you guys don't know, we have offices in the basement of the Capitol and we've now emerged from the basement of the Capitol. So just soaking that in. And Ellis. I'm Ellis Julin. I'm with Montana Public Radio, and I am transitioning into a new role, um, being the Rocky Mountain Front reporter. So that also involves a lot of sunshine, which I'm very thankful for. I feel like I look like a, a little bit of a pasty vampire emerging from the basement after the last four months. <laughs> so this is a show about answering uh, your questions this evening about the legislature. Um, so again, those go in the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. This is the best way for us to be able to see your questions, we may miss it if you put it through the chat. So again, submit those questions through the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. And before we get to some of those questions, uh, we haven't had a show since Sine Die, and a lot happened in the final days of the legislative session. So question to all of you, um, you know, what stood out in those final days? I'll jump in here. I think uh, something that's been on a lot of people's minds that we saw come up at the very end of the session um, was the centering of Representative Zoe Zephyr from Missoula. Uh, that happened over the course of about a week, two weeks, and it took up a lot of uh, energy and, and space and um, time in the Capitol. Um, as a lot of you probably know and have read, Representative Zephyr um, was first not recognized in the House for comments she made on a bill to ban gender-affirming care for transgender minors. Um, the, a majority of Republicans in the House upheld that decision. Um, and then we saw a protest in the House, uh, and it was um, one of the largest events I've ever seen happen at, at the Capitol. It's not something I've covered um, with a, an event like that with such intensity before. Um, and I think that was a big moment for, for a lot of people in the Capitol. Uh, Zephyr was then, um, a, again, a majority of Republicans in the House uh, voted to bar her from entering the House. And uh, that was for actions uh, during the protest when she held a microphone above her head and stayed on the floor. So I think for all of us, for all of us, um, that took a lot of time to to understand exactly what was happening, get the details right, and and why it was happening. And also, it brought work to a standstill in the Capitol. Um, There's about three days where the House didn't vote on on bills or do as much work as it normally would do. Uh, so that that was definitely a big event that that we all um, were watching. Yeah, I think I'll just. Uh sort of add to that. Um, 
it, it was interesting too because it, it it showed I think that at a certain point the partisan divisions uh, in the House especially become really solid. You know, uh, in in some of the previous rules votes to uphold the Speaker's decision uh, whether or not to recognize Representative Zephyr on the floor, there have been a few Republicans, people like Greg Frazier from Deer Lodge, uh, who you know are also people who generally vote against um, sort of uh, restrictions on LGBTQ healthcare and expression. So people voted with Zephyr and the Democrats on those votes. And then uh, ultimately still voted to censure and bar her from the floor after the protests. Uh, you know, I, I think for some of those people, uh, the sort of comparatively moderate Republican class, uh, the concept of there being um, direct action in the gallery was sort of a bridge too far. Um, and, you know, which is not to comment on that as a strategy necessarily, but uh, you know, I think that there were a lot of people that felt that they could maybe resist uh, voting with the party on trans issues uh, for much of the session. But uh, when it came to something like this, that, you know, obviously is national news, uh, there's a ton of scrutiny on the speaker for uh, this was just not the opportunity for them to stick their necks out. Shift gears a little bit. There was other stuff um, going on the last few days of the session, like particularly on the Senate side, which was well, the Zephyr stuff was going on that protest. The Senate was actually hearing the state's major budget bill, House Bill 2. So $14 billion of spending was being debated on the Senate floor simultaneously to that protest. Um, so I spent the last week of the session kind of watching the last, you know, strands of fiscal policy kind of play themselves out, including a, a bill that passed, um, depending on how you count, more than $200 million of spending for housing. So there, there was some other big stuff and a, a policy, nuts and bolts policy sense moving around as well. Any other kind of takeaways from those final days of the session? Yeah, I can chime in from the Senate side of things. Um, we saw the Senate signing die and an end before the House. There was a lot of, I think, surprise with the with that motion and the House kind of scatter, kind of scrambling to get everything wrapped up once the Senate did that. I know I kind of sat there with my jaw on the floor as it was all happening. It's kind of surreal. And we saw some interesting stuff kind of go on with that. I think pretty notably Senate Bill 442, the um, bill to decide how marijuana re tax revenue is going to be spent and, and allocated. And so that bill is kind of in a weird holding pattern right now. We'll probably get into it more in the session. But the Senate the Senate signing died, the governor vetoed the bill, and the House hadn't adjourned yet. And so it's kind of in a in a funky gray area. That's something I've been watching. And an, a, another couple of bills just to mention that really were thrown into limbo in some sense um, with that signy die motion were actually a couple of bills that passed earlier in the session with broad um, bipartisan support, I think in some cases unanimous um, support. And those were um, House Bill 37, which was a major reform to child welfare and to foster care and emergency child removals in the state. So what happened with that bill and another couple of bills um, as well were that the, the the governor decided to send them back with suggested amendments, but really at the 11th hour, and it, it kind of raised a lot of eyebrows. And, and even like when I forwarded the suggested amendments to the bill sponsor, she didn't know that those amend, amendments were coming until reporters started asking her questions about them. And so it kind of raises the, the, the suspicion that perhaps the governor's office also didn't know that the Senate was going to sign a die so quickly because if, if they did, they might not have sent back proposed amendments that you can't really deal with when both chambers aren't in session and they're ready to, to grapple with those amendments and debate them. So it, in essence, what happens is that the bills actually go back to the governor's desk in their original form. And now it's up to Governor Gianforte to um, sign or veto them. And in, in this situation that he does decide to veto them, uh, again, very popular policies among lawmakers, then we go into this period of deciding, of lawmakers being polled remotely and deciding whether or not they're going to overturn vetoes that come after they've all left Helena. So there's kind of going to be addendums, <laughs> likely addendum, addendums coming um, in, in the upcoming weeks. And we've Go for and, for those who, and, and for those who don't know, sine die is, is just a fancy Latin name for motion to adjourn. So those are the votes that in, in the session. And the, the House and Senate do them separately, which 
can and it can come suddenly because it all it takes is somebody makes the motion and they vote and then they're done and so it's not always planned like we saw this year Great. Let's move on to some listener questions. And again, those go in the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. They may get lost in the chat. So please put those in the ask a question uh, area. One of the questions we've gotten so far um, was, was this session uniquely contentious or did it just seem that way? Who wants to tackle that one? Eric? I don't know that everybody here is going to agree with me on this, but to my to my this is my third session, and I I don't actually think it's the most contentious session I've covered. I, I felt like last session when we had all the the kind of the the usual the traditional political angst in the building, along with all the COVID angst at the same time, that felt more stressful to me. It felt like people in the building were r- running more frayed, uh, finding more reasons to get upset at each other. You know, there were certainly contentiousness in the building as there is every session and as there is always in political processes like the legislature. But I actually felt like the temperature was a little bit cooler this year. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think that, it, you know, it, maybe people are, are a little tired of hearing about the fight between Representative Zephyr and some of her constituents and Republicans in the building. But I think it's just worth noting how much that did bleed into various parts of, of lawmaking this session. And when you have um, every major national news outlet publishing, you know, stories and rehashes about what's going on in the Montana Capitol, and you have um, people calling lawmakers for interviews, documentary crews showing up in the house, <laughs> uh, trying to get access. I mean, it was it was pretty chaotic. And I think one way that that filtered down for lawmakers is that they were really inundated with calls, emails, text messages, a ton of input from people who either agreed or disagreed with whatever was going on in, in Montana and flooding their their mailboxes and i think that um that made lawmakers feel um like they couldn't they couldn't quite like clear (laughs) clear the way to focus on some of the key priorities that they had and you know for democrats that there was definitely a feeling that a lot of policies that they had worked very hard for throughout the session were being um cast aside or um tabled or or shelved um because of political angst and so there might be some lawmakers who say this was a session unlike any others uh, or un- unlike any prior ones they've they've worked um, because there were some of those those factors going on. COVID, I'll just add, who, I you know, think who, who, oh. what can compare to the COVID session of 2021. So it's all kind of relative. I just was going to add, I think there's there's a th- uh the contentiousness is also a product of expectation versus reality. Going into this session, we kept hearing about the Republican supermajority and um, uh, the Republicans holding the governor's office as well. And we expect them to be, um, you know, working together and having similar priorities. But at the end of the session, uh, Senate Majority Leader Steve Fitzpatrick told us the supermajority made lawmaking harder at times, and it made it more difficult to to find consensus and, and get things across the finish line. And we also saw quite a bit of friction between Republicans and, our, and the governor. Um, so I think it's also just we have this expectation of what that'll look like. But in reality, it's it's it was harder than um, than we thought it was going to be. Let's get to another listener question. Um, someone is asking, uh, tell us more about uh, by the end of the legislative session, it ended suddenly and early. Were there issues left on the floor? I could maybe try to tackle this one. Um, so it's kind of funny because when the session, when the Senate, I should say, voted to adjourn sine die to end the session, um, there was this really pronounced negative response from the majority leader and the Senate president, you know, basically saying that, you know, we're going to, there, there's things in limbo right now that we need to be considering that, you know, this is going to be bad. Um, and then within like an hour, they had basically found ways in the rules to essentially reverse time in the house and make it so that legislation that is different in the house and the Senate was the same. So like to sort of step back a bit, the, the real reason that this was a problem is that for a bill to pass out of the legislature, it has to be identical across both chambers. So each the House and the Senate has to approve the same version of a bill, right? But because uh, they don't operate on the same timeline, often they're dealing with different versions of a bill. And there is an expectation that by the end of the session, they can go into what are called conference committees uh, to reconcile the different versions. 
Um, and what the Senate adjourning did was end the Senate's work for the session while there were still several incongruencies between uh, different versions of the same bill in the House and Senate. You know, they were, there was an, they were planning on having more conference committees that evening. You know, I, I, for uh, clearly some people knew that this was a plan that was happening. For those that didn't, you know, they were expecting uh, they were going to go back to committee, reconcile different versions of bills. So that meant that the House had to then uh, reconsider its votes on bills in order to go back to a version that matched what the Senate had. And that allowed them to pass the vast majority of things that I think the Republican majority leadership actually really cared about this session. Um, you know, the, there, there was uh, some sort of technical language in some bills that died at the last minute, uh, you know, relevant to, um, uh, you know, appropriations and things like that. Um, I don't think that there's anything super significant. I mean, if, if, if it ends up being that SB 442 uh, dies because of how the signing die motion went, you know, I, that would be like a huge, a huge deal. I mean, because this is a bill you that remind us, in all session. Remind us what, what that bill did. Sure, yeah. So, so this is the marijuana bill, revenues bill that Ellis referenced earlier. Uh, you know, basically it, it expands upon uh, a method for allocating recreational marijuana tax revenue that the legislature passed in 2021. Lawmakers spent a good chunk of the session working on it with broad bipartisan agreement and a lot of stakeholders. Uh, and depending on who you ask, through some sort of technical trickery at the last second of the session, it was vetoed in a way that may preclude lawmakers from overruling that veto out of session. Another question we've got is how many bills passed that were truly bipartisan? Eric, this is probably a question for you. Yeah, so I, I actually did some counting earlier this evening, and I have a prop, first time on a radio. I don't know if you can actually see that. Uh, hopefully the image is right. Yeah, so there are, well, that's, nobody can actually read that, but there are about 800 bills passed in total during the, the course of the session. And of those, uh, about three quarters actually passed with uh, bipartisan support, which I defined here as like more than half of Democrats voted for them in addition to however many Republicans it took to pass it. Um, so again, the, the, the thing to know is that not the stuff we cover in the news a lot of times and not necessarily the most significant legislation, but like most legislation passes with bipartisan support in the ledge. Um, and then on the flip side, there were, by my count, 98 bills, so about 12% of the total that passed uh, with fewer than five Democrats voting for it. So there, there are the partisan bills. We did have a Republican supermajority this time, and they, they did pass some stuff. So that kind of hopefully gives you some context in terms of like the relative breakdown of all that. I hope Mara's laughing at me. Like, yeah, for, uh, the, for those yeah. of you who may be listening to this after the fact, uh, Eric was holding up a piece of paper that just proved how good of a data journalist he is. Um, yeah. Also how messy how handwriting is. <laughs> Let's we'll talk about that later. Thanks for the numbers, Eric. Would, would, would you maybe show that in a slightly broader frame, Eric, so we can see the people can see the whole piece of paper instead of just one number? Like closer to your face. In, okay, tell me where. I'm, back up your like, back up your body. Other way. Yeah, there we oh, go. Oh, that that other direction. Okay. Um, so we did not rehearse this at all. So. Um, okay, we're done. Excellent. <laughs> um, another question we got um, about bills and kind of the number of them. Were any of the bills uh, written from out-of-state entities, and if so, which ones? You know, sometimes we hear about bills that come up in other states that are you know very similar to ones that come up in Montana. Any specific ones come to mind this session? Um, this is totally an area for more reporting going forward. But I think on on my beat, um, on on the healthcare beat, some of many of the the bills affecting. Um, trans Montanans, um, specifically Senate Bill 99. I don't know if they are carbon copies necessarily of bills in other states, but certainly we are seeing many of the same bills being brought in many, many, many state legislatures. Um, actually, just today, earlier, I think it was Eric and I were talking about a bill um, that's being debated in Texas today that's very similar to the to the bill we saw in Montana to restrict drag performances, um, and even down to one of the amendments that was being considered, which would have struck references to drag and replaced it with something more like adult-oriented performances. So 
You know, typically um, we we know that there are a lot of interest groups that are pushing legislation around the country and trying to get them picked up in Montana and in other states. And we we can request the what's called the junk file that shows the drafting process um, for once once a lawmaker requests a bill, you can see kind of the back and forth editing process that goes on with legislative staff. I didn't see anything that um, obviously showed um, some specific group um, suggesting line edits, but a lot of that can happen behind the scenes. Um, and I think it's just fair to say that there's been a nationalization of, of so many topics that um, it, it is, it, I don't know, the topics feel less homegrown, um, especially when they're about hot button issues like LGBTQ people and abortion and um, maybe charter schools and, and other topics like that. I have, I have, I have a couple maybe more specific examples. I mean, right to work is kind of the classic bill mill bill, right? Uh, and, you know, for, for those who don't know, it's, it's uh, basically pertains to, uh, uh, you know, membership laws, cl close and open shops for unions. Um, if you're a union person, obviously, you know what this is. I'm not a union person. It's hard for me to kind of explain this in a way that, uh, but it, it, this is a, a sort of classic policy in the sort of fight about organized labor and state legislatures across the country. We saw that this session uh, you know, the bill ultimately failed. I, I, these bills have been written basically the same way forever, um, you know, from from groups like the National Right to Work Committee, which has a Montana chapter. Uh, I, you know, I think another interesting example was some bills that we saw in the second half of the session uh, concerning uh, our Senate elections. I, you know, these got a lot of press at the time. Uh, long story short, these are basic. Uh, the, the, the main bill was one that would have eliminated Montana's partisan primaries and replaced it with the top two primary system, uh, but only for the 2024 U.S. Senate race. And basically a top two primary is the candidates with the top two most votes in a primary advance, regardless of their partisan affiliation. Um, and if you kind of game out the scenario, the effect that this has uh, in Montana, generally speaking, is limiting the ability of Libertarian and Green Party candidates to make it on to the ballot, uh, especially Libertarians. And, uh, you know, as more reporting came out about this in Montana and nationally, uh, you know, the, the evidence was pretty clear that this was a coordinated effort by the uh, the national organization, uh, the affiliate of the GOP called the National Republican Senatorial Committee that um, supports U.S. Senate Republican candidates. Uh, at a, uh, you could see that it was kind of the idea came from them. Uh, the NRSC is run by Montana's junior U.S. Senator, Steve Daines, who's a Republican, or he's the chairman, I should say. Uh, and in 2024, we have what will be uh, what is already a, a pretty contentious Senate race for the seat held by Democrat John Tester. Uh, and, you know, obviously that that bill came from uh, a Montana senator's staff, effectively. Uh, so I, I don't want to say that it's fully out of state, but in the sense that this was something that was communicated to the state legislature as a priority by a Washington, D.C. interest, then it's a pretty solid example. Another question we got is, what kind of influence did the Freedom Caucus have during the session, if any? This might be also maybe a me question. Sure, and if you could maybe explain for those who don't know what the Freedom Caucus is, for those who aren't familiar. Sure, so the the real, the sort of the OG Freedom Caucus is the, is the House Freedom Caucus in Congress. Um, and this is, you know, the group that got headlines recently for its sort of parliamentary maneuvers against um, would-be and now current Speaker Kevin McCarthy uh, to extract basic, basically concessions. Um, they're, generally speaking, conservative hardliners, hard right, um, you know, kind of Trump affiliate folks. Uh, you know, Matt Rosendale, Montana's, uh, uh, one of Montana's congressmen is a member uh, and he was instrumental this session in helping this uh, other group called the uh, State Freedom Caucus Network, which basically is an affiliate of the House Freedom Caucus that supports um, similar caucuses of state legislators in state legislatures um, across the country. Uh, and Rosendale kind of got a group of hardliners in the Montana legislature connected with this network called the State Freedom Caucus Network again. And uh, I think by the end of the session, it counted maybe like 20 members, uh, generally of the sort of right of right flank of the Montana Republican Party. Um, you know, it, it also pays through financing that is not super clear, uh, a state director who acts as like a uh, press person uh, for the Montana Freedom Caucus here in the legislature. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it 
the chairman is, is Teresa Manzella, who's a senator from from the Hamilton area that um, I think a lot of people may have heard of. I mean, she's she's sort of the face, I think, of uh, the hard line in the in the Senate, especially in the, in the legislature. She was the chair. Um, a lot of other prominent kind of uh, hard line conservatives um, were members. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, I think they probably had more of a role in the House, which tends to be a little bit more ideological um, and where, you know, I think it's fair to say that House Speaker Matt Regeer was a more f fervent conservative, more ideological and, and more sort of attuned to the, the base than Jason Ellsworth, the Senate president, um, who's also from Hamilton and is a Republican. Uh, you know, when, when I asked about the Freedom Caucus from Majority Leader Steve Fitzpatrick, uh, in the Senate, he's a Republican from Great Falls last last week after session ended. You know, he basically said, yeah, I didn't think they were an annoyance. I didn't think they were an uh, interest group. I mean, basically what, what leaders will tell you when you ask them about the Freedom Caucus is that uh, lawmakers are welcome to form caucuses however they want. There's a, sportsman, there's a sportsman's caucus. There's a this caucus. There's a that caucus. There's a caucus of lawmakers who sing the national anthem. But, you know, it's uh, it it. it it's hard to quantify because, you know, there by the time you actually get to leadership, there's a, a fair amount of isolation, I think, from the rank and file and a lot of decisions, you know, sort of tend to get made at that at that high level. Um, but I think it is certainly notable that, you know, Montana, a state known for, you know, sort of relatively pluralistic politics for a long time uh, is, you know, now the home for for a, a hard right interest group with national ties. You know, and, and why I think Wyoming and Idaho got uh, freedom caucuses at the same time. Mm -hmm. We have a, a question that, um, Ellis, this might be for you. Um, tell us more about how climate and the environment figured into bills debated and passed this session. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. I'm slow to click up my unmute button there. Um, I, I think the two big bills that, um, come to mind when we talk about this. The first one is House Bill 971. Um, that was brought. We saw lawmakers in the House suspend the rules to introduce that bill after the deadline for, for introductions of bills like that. And that bill um, essentially says that when Montana is conducting an environmental assessment looking at the Montana Environmental Policy Act or MEPA, they can't consider greenhouse gas emissions or climate change impacts both within and outside of Montana's borders. Uh, supporters of the bill brought it in response to the uh, decision with Northwestern Energy's plant in Laurel and the judge's ruling that the that revoked the air quality permit for that plant, basically saying they didn't take into account greenhouse gas emissions when the MEPA process was done. Um, opponents of the bill say that this is too far reaching and not considering greenhouse gas emissions is omitting a huge environmental impact. And then the, the broader implications of not considering how a proposed development project on state lands would affect the climate is, is also a big component of that. And then it, there's Senate bill 557. I might have that number wrong, um, but that was brought on the Senate side, really similar to the 971 bill. Those bills kind of go hand in hand. And that bill is more targeting the environmental groups that bring lawsuits against the state on the grounds of MEPA. And that makes now makes it so that groups have to post a bond and um, kind of prove that they're going to be able to win in court if they're bringing litigation that could stall out any sort of project um, on state lands that could be a proposed mine, a logging, it's it's a wide array of things that fall under that MEPA classification. And I think it's also important if we're going to talk about climate change, too, to think about maybe a little bit of what didn't happen. We saw before the session a couple of different bill draft requests to look at and, and change Montana's constitutional language for a right to a clean and healthful environment. And none of those ended up getting introduced during the session. We didn't see that happen. And um, that was one in, in a long kind of list of constitutional amendments that didn't secure enough. Well, there were a lot that didn't secure enough votes. That one never even got introduced in the first place. So those two are the two big ones when it comes to, to climate policy in Montana. And those will affect what is included in that Environmental Policy Act, which looks at any sort of impact that development projects could have.
Thanks to those of you who submitted questions. You can keep doing that in the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. We'll go till 8 o'clock and try to get as many questions as we can answered. And a quick note um, about how we can keep bringing you this information and events like this. Montana Public Radio, Montana Free Press, and Yellowstone Public Radio are all organizations that are able to do what we do because of financial investment from listeners and readers, people just like you chipping in uh, what they can to make a difference. So thank you for all of you who uh, are investing in this work. Again, questions go in the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen. And we've got another question here. Um, We've got a number of questions about legal challenges to bills. Um, How many bills have been challenged so far and what's next for them? I think by my count, I only have two on my beat. I'm not sure about everybody else, but um, yeah, on the abortion and transgender healthcare um, front, arguably some of the most controversial bills uh, debated the session, uh, we've seen two legal challenges so far. One against Senate Bill 99, which broadly bans gender affirming um, care for transgender minors, specifically puberty blockers, hormone therapies, and um, and surgeries that are very, very, very rare, exceedingly rare um, in the U.S., but especially in Montana. Um, so that has been challenged in court as of Tuesday by the ACLU and Lambda Legal, kind of a mix of national and local groups. And the plaintiffs in that case are a couple of families who would be impacted and a couple of medical providers as well who would have to stop um, providing the, that care in Montana or face uh, professional challenges, professional ramifications, I should say. And then on the abortion front, um, House Bill 575, Shayla, you can check me on that, but I think that's right. Um, That has been kind of added on to a pre-existing, a a lawsuit that was filed a little bit ago um, because it has a requirement for an ultrasound before somebody can receive an abortion. That's been an issue that was also um, codified in 2021 and has been, um, well, semi-codified in 2021, um, a related issue, I should say. And that's also been enjoined in courts um, in an ongoing court case in Yellowstone County. So um, that uh, that bill has been blocked from going into effect. And then kind of separately, but also on the lawsuit front, there is a, a state health department rule that would restrict Medicaid coverage for, um, for abortions. And even though a rule, an administrative rule is different from a law, it, there is some overlap in terms of uh, Republican priorities between lawmakers and the executive branch on that topic. And that bill has also, or sorry, that rule has also been uh, enjoined temporarily while, um, while the case continues. And I actually think that a lot of those, um, those topics are going to be up for a hearing in um, a couple weeks, I think, in towards the end of May in, in Helena. So more to come on the legal front for abortion and trans health care. Yeah, I was just going to note something about lawsuit tracking, just so people can get an idea of how this works and where it goes from here. There are several lawsuits that we are tracking from last session um, and that are not near the end yet um, and by last yeah. session do you mean 2021 legislative I mean, session yes thank you because we've now ended the last session the last last session 2021 um there are still challenges that that we are waiting to hear about that will probably influence challenges that are ongoing now but it's a huge mishmash it lawsuit coverage is a marathon not a sprint so it's just that's a big part of our job Lawsuit like certain... season is the way that I like to think about it. So yeah. There's legislative season, now we're in lawsuit season. And lawsuit season won't be over until the snow starts falling. So, And for those of you who uh, know the budget, I think the uh, there was a request to increase uh, funding for the defense of, or give more money to uh, agencies that defend lawsuits. Is that right? And did that get included in the final budget? Yeah, so it's $2 million, I think, over the next biennium, which is two years, we, we, we budget in two year spans um, since the legislature meets every other year uh, for uh, basically litigation expenses in the Department of Justice. Um, and that will go towards, among other things, defending laws passed by the legislature. Um, and that that was, a I believe that was a new request this session. And, and I think that they cited in their sort of just the, the DOJ's Montana Department of Justice, which is essentially the attorney general um, and then a bunch of other sort of related agencies. Uh, they cited the fact that there is an increased prevalence of litigation around bills passed by the legislature as one of the justifications. 
uh, for requesting this money. Um, I, I, another interesting note is as part of that same request, they uh, successfully obtained a contract renewal uh, for Emily Jones, who is a private practice civil attorney and uh, wife of a prominent uh, advisor to the Attorney General Austin Knutson, political advisor, uh, who has been uh, assisting essentially on all of the Department of Justice civil litigation um, at a at a, a a livable sum. I'll say that. Um, uh, yeah. So so that that was that was a big part of the Department of Justice and the, and the Attorney General's office's budget request for the session. Turning now to another question we got. Um... Housing policy was a big uh, issue for a lot of people heading into the session. Um, Eric, I know you covered this. I mean, it's kind of a broad question, but tell us what happened. Yeah, so a lot happened. Um, that really were, were two big thrusts as I've been thinking about it. Uh, what, one is what is regulatory reform, uh, basically action that's intended to make it easy to build. And the thinking there, which has been wholly embraced by Republicans, particularly the governor, and it, sometimes by more progressive Democrats as well, is that the root of the housing pain in the state is that there just aren't enough houses here relative to the number of people who want to live in our last best place. And so the solution is to make it easy, as they see it, is to make it easier to build. Uh, so a bunch of bills went through, some of them right, kind of kind of cracked down on, on big cities like Bozeman and Missoula that in the, the minds of critics have um, like maybe, maybe made it too hard to build, maybe have local zoning rules that are too strict and make it too hard to build with places where there are already streets and sewer lines and infrastructure. Um, th that's that zoning policy stuff is pretty wonky, so I don't need to say more about that. Uh, we also, it was unclear if this was going to happen, but like I mentioned briefly, we did get a big housing spending package out of the legislature too. I think $225 million total in spending there. Um, it, in the several different buckets, there's some money for infrastructure to make it easier to build new housing, which is an expensive part of construction. And then there's also some money for low interest loans for people that are building like affordable uh, apartments targeted at very low-income people that are then rented at restricted rates. Um, there's a bunch, I just published it, we just dropped a, a large, longest story at Free Press today trying to detail that, and so I'll save you me trying to explain that policy from the hip. So. And I think later on in the chat you'll be able to uh, find some links to stories from the reporters you're hearing on the call if you want to dive in deeper on any of these issues. Um, turning back to Something that, Ellis, you mentioned, we got a question about constitutional amendments and uh, why, you know, why do you all think and what does your reporting show about how none of those advanced? Ellis, you want to kick us? Ellis, you go ahead first. Okay. Um, I didn't want to be the only person talking about this because I think we saw constitutional amendments across a broad array of what we all cover um, in our respective beats. But we definitely saw a lot of constitutional amendments proposed. We saw less of the ones that were proposed actually get introduced and, and make it through to, to being voted on on the floors. But even though the Republican supermajority had the votes to pass these amendments, to get these on the ballot, it would re it still requires two thirds of the legislature, and that's just a ton of people. And I think it's indicative of the fact that there are 150 lawmakers, there are 150 viewpoints, and not everyone could come to agreement on a lot of these constitutional amendments. I can say just for a specific example, the right to hunt amendment was one that I followed pretty closely, and I think we saw a lot of lawmakers when that bill was first on the floor in the House kind of bring, bring different amendments or express concerns they had with that legislation. And it only takes a couple of people not jumping on board with their party line vote for those to fail. And I think we saw that time and time again. And maybe other folks can talk about other bills. Um, I'll, I'll back off now. <laughs> yeah, I think just to explain how the mechanics of this make this really difficult a little bit more. Um, yeah, so as Ella said, it's a two thirds vote. Republicans have 102 seats, and it, it's not just a two-thirds vote. It's a two-thirds vote across the entire legislature of 150 people. Um, and Republicans have 102 seats. That's two more than a two-thirds supermajority. But they also have a lot of internal factions, divisions, differences of opinion. Um, and uh, it, it all, uh, not only, I mean, a couple is two, I guess, but it, it all they needed to all Democrats who were unilaterally opposed to almost every proposal to amend the Constitution 
Um, all Democrats needed to do was get two Republicans across the entire legislature to vote no on these bills, which as it turns out is not that hard to do. Um, you know, there's almost two Republicans who are voting against the party on dozens of different issues. Um, and, you know, Montana is a state that has a lot of fealty to its institutions and its institutional history. Um, and I think that uh, they got this feeling both from their constituents and within themselves that um, that amending the Constitution is something that maybe they don't feel that the voters actually support. Be because just to be clear, they can't do it themselves. Anything that they did pass, if they had passed the right to hunt a, hunt a trap, for example, it would have gone to the voters um, and in 2024, and then they would have had a chance uh, to, to, to vote yes or no. So, I mean, they can't amend the Constitution themselves. So I think, you know, there's differences of ideology. It's just mechanically really hard. You know, again, to go back to um, uh, Senate Majority Leader Fitzpatrick, he told us that he never expected any of these bills to pass um, and that he always thought it was kind of silly that people did. Uh, yeah, so Senator Dunwell in the chat raises a good point. There was one amendment proposal relating to a mental health trust proposed by Sen Senator Ken Bogner, who's a Republican from Miles City, that did have some Democratic votes. Um, Senator Dunwell will have to explain why the caucus ended up not supporting that. But uh, uh, suffice it to say, I think Democrats probably saw any effort to amend the Constitution, even if it was good policy in their eyes, as opening a door to um, more dramatic overhauls of provisions like the right to privacy that you know Democrats in particular hold really dear. And Mara has something to say. Yeah, I mean, I was going to talk about right to privacy. So like one of the big fears after the last um, election was that Republicans were going to bring some kind of constitutional amendment to gut the right to privacy, um, specifically as it relates to abortion, because Montana has its own abortion protection separate from Roe versus Wade that is really derived from the right to privacy, the right to medical autonomy um, in Montana's constitution, um, really interpreted it as the right to procreative autonomy. Uh, if you look at the legal ruling. But anyway, so one of the interesting things about this session was that we saw a ton of abortion legislation, like more than last session by a lot, and it really spanned the gamut. I mean, things about medication abortion restrictions, things about abortion after 24 weeks, um, things about um, the most common procedure for abortion in the second trimester. And Republicans are trying this from all different angles. But what they didn't do, Eric's cat might know this, he seems to have joined the call right now. What, what they did not do is put a, um, like a personhood amendment on the ballot for voters to engage with. And Republicans that I, I talked to about their abortion legislation said, we were actually quite limited and, and reserved in our strategy here. We did not bring a personhood amendment. And when I pushed them a little bit and said, do you think that's because voters would have rejected it? They said, well, we, the, the process for voting on things at the ballot has become so inundated with outside influence groups and money that it's not really a true test of, vote, of voter sentiment. It, we don't believe that voters' voices will be able to, to like overcome the money and like the, the advertising, the campaigning around constitutional initiatives, ballot proposals and things like that. So I just thought that was that was really fascinating. And it shows that just because you have the numbers, the strategy is a completely different ballpark. Yeah, and I think I think it's you might remember that in the 2022 election, there was a tangentially related ballot initiative, um, LR 131, which I can't really explain the specifics of off the top of my head, but it was like something that was construed as being a sort of referendum on abortion, I think, by people who wanted to resist anti-choice legislation in the state. And I remember talking to Greg Hertz, I think, who is a sort of senior Republican senator from Polson, um, about, you know, what he thought about sort of what the results of that initiative said. And he was like, well, you know, kind of regardless of what the initiative says, Montanans probably don't support a full on ban on abortion. And, you know, that's sort of what a personhood amendment would be approaching. Um, and, you know, so, so I, I think there is a fair amount of calculus um, based on what had happened in 2022 and, and the sort of elections post row. One thing to add on that topic, and then I promise we'll move on, Corin, is that one interesting workaround we saw to the abortion issue and the right to privacy was something that I've never heard or seen of before. I don't know about anybody else. It was a law that interpreted the right to privacy that exists in the Constitution, Senate Bill 154, sponsored by another senior Republican senator, um, Senator Keith Regeer from Kalispell. And what it what it really does is just say the right to privacy in the Montana con Constitution does not construe 
a right to an abortion. I have no idea how that's going to be challenged in court, if it's going to be challenged in court, but clearly it's, it is a, a new strategy and a new tactic because you're defining a constitutional provision. It would be like saying the right to a clean and healthful environment does not, um, you know, does not prevent mining in Montana or something like that. It just is such an interesting strategy. So we haven't seen a legal challenge to that yet. I'm not really sure if it even does anything, um, but that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Turning to another question now, um, did any bills pass about redistricting and voting rights? So uh, someone might need to explain redistricting if folks on the call don't know what that is. Um, Shaley, I know you've been covering this, but uh, do others want to jump in on that? Uh, sorry, I'm always slow. Uh, yeah, I think Aaron and I can both try to tackle this. Um, it's interesting. So redistricting is the process that happens every 10 years when um, an independent board in Montana draws new political boundaries. Um, so that's 150 legislative districts in Montana and two congre well, yeah, two U.S. House districts now. Um, and it was interesting. That was a that was something a lot of us covered for the past two years, and it was really complicated and really contentious and really political because it determines political power and it determines uh, the makeup of the legislature and how many seats are held by each party. Um, you know, it's not an exact science by any means, but it it, it influences. And someone was reminding me not too long ago that that the legislature had to offer up their own thoughts on the maps that were adopted by the committee and that happened this last session and it feels like it was six years ago but it was like in december and january um and and lawmakers were were not happy with uh what well excuse me republican lawmakers were not happy with what the the commission uh put forth and so there were a couple different bills um aimed at redistricting i don't think there was a bill that passed that significantly changed the process that was was a partisan bill. There were a couple bipartisan bills that aimed to um, aim to change the process. And maybe Aaron wants to talk about those. But it, there was a lot of talk about it at the beginning of the session. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that just to continue about the things that didn't pass, I mean, I think the most significant proposal was one to... Um, Asked the voters whether to amend the constitution to insert some requirements for the redistricting commission, which would have essentially prevented it from openly discussing political data. Um, which, if you watched the redistricting process before, um, they there is a lot of discussion of political data. You know, th th there might be some pearl clutching about it, but uh, you know, there's a historical record in the state. You know, certainly going back to the 2010 maps and beyond, of uh, both parties, you know, seeking to draw maps in a way that. Um, uh, you know, that meet certain redistricting criteria, but, you know, also make it easier for them to win seats. Um, and so this was a, one, this was one of several constitutional amendments that ultimately didn't succeed. Um, and it was certainly not the most sort of radical overhaul to, of the redistricting commission that lawmakers even briefly pondered the session. I know there was one idea kicking around for a while to somehow replace the whole process with an algorithm that never got off the ground. Um, what, <laughs> what did pass, um, and, and I guess just, to talk a little bit about what the maps look like. I mean, so in the House, um, you know, I, I think we'll probably see on paper something like a 60 40, uh, akin to a 60 40 split, which would cost Republicans quite a few seats. What did pass is, as somebody just pointed out in chat, SB 109. This is uh, legislation that basically it started out as a way of enacting new districts for the Public Service Commission that a court ordered uh, during the interim to correct gross misbalances in population between PSC districts, which hadn't been redrawn in decades. Unlike legislative districts, which are drawn by this independent commission, PSC districts are still drawn by the legislature in Montana. And, and the PSC is the body that oversees uh, monopoly regulated utilities in the state like Northwestern. Um, and, uh, uh, and it also is sort of like a, a uh, stepping stone to higher office for a lot of especially Republican politicians. Um, and uh, you know the court ordered uh, the maps be redrawn to a, a create a more or less equal population in these ways. Uh, Senator Keith Regeer, who got mentioned earlier, a Republican from the Flathead Valley, uh, he is the Senate Judiciary Committee chair, and he introduced a, an amendment to that bill, which would have enacted these new PSC districts, 
uh, that basically redrew them um, in accordance with uh, basically his, it, he had some own ideas about criteria. It divided the new 100 uh, house districts that the Districting and Apportionment, Apportionment Commission drew into for the five PSC districts, 20 house districts per district. Um, it basically creates a map that splits a lot of cities in a way that makes it would make it very difficult for Democratic candidates to win a PSC seat. Um, Republicans already have uh, total control of the PSC. They have five of five seats. So I'm not sure if it is going to make a dramatic change in anybody's life, but um, it certainly makes it, it would seem to make the PSC more likely to remain conservative into the future. And then the bipartisan redistricting commission changes that Shaley talked about, uh, the most important one, I think, uh, basically um, requires that the Montana Department of Corrections, which you know, oversees the state prison, records uh, the last known address of incarcerated Montanans that come into the prison so that when there is redistricting, the redistricting commission can essentially match an incarcerated person with their hometown, um, which provides more proportional representation to their home district um, and reduces this problem called prison gerrymandering, where districts that have state facilities like prisons in them tend to be overrepresented because uh, the census counts prisoners as residents of prisons that detain them as opposed to the communities that raise them. We have about 10 minutes left, uh, time for a couple more questions. Um, can someone talk about the increase in Medicaid reimbursement rates? And was it surprising that the legislature increased those rates as much as they did more than the governor asked for? I feel like somebody asked this question just to make me happy. So <laughs> whoever asked this, thank you so much. Um, this is such a huge topic. It was a huge issue really from start to finish in the legislature. Um, so yes, you're, I mean, the, the summary that the question contained is correct. The governor's office proposed an increase to Medicaid provider rates, which is basically how much the state is willing to pay providers who, um, treat patients who have public insurance. So that's what we mean when we say Medicaid provider rates. Um, Montana's Medicaid provider rates have been seriously low, um, dramatically underfunded for a very long time. Providers have often gotten like 1%, 2% rate increases a year if they're lucky. Um, but it's it's really been, as some lawmakers say, the crumbs that, that providers get. So there was a study kind of confirmed all of that. The governor's office proposed a, a, about a 10% increase to the base and mostly like providers and um, patients and advocates, public health advocates and Democrats really were like, no dice, this is ridiculous. This is not nearly enough with the surplus that we have to fund this, this disconnect, this gap that we have. And for, for a lot of providers, they're so dependent on Medicaid funds because their patient profiles, their patient demographics are, you know, 50%, 60% Medicaid. So if Medicaid rates are low, they're just like hemorrhaging money. Uh, basically. So yes, Republicans also, especially in the House, there was a strong coalition of Republicans from, from jump, from the beginning, who said, we need to do more to keep Medicaid providers afloat in our communities. And really, it was um, the hard work of a lot of uh, Republicans in the House, especially on the Budget Committee, that kind of shifted things around in the budget and got the Medicaid provider rates um, up quite a bit higher. Democrats still said that's not enough. And the, the, the chess match really continued for the rest of the session. And finally, at the last kind of like the, the 11th hour, there was some maneuvering in the Senate. Um, the, a Democrat bill died, maybe for political reasons, but the Senate brought back a different proposal that added another like chunk of change to the Medicaid provider rates. So what all this means is that Basically, providers that I'm hearing from are saying, we think we can stay open. We think that we can continue to provide services. We think we will stop closing things like group homes, um, things like nursing homes, hopefully. Um, that's something that is a little different, but um, but functionally very impacted by, by Medicaid rates. And the total funding for this, I just got some numbers today, um, the state general fund effectively put about $100 million more into Medicaid rates um, compared to, to last compared to current rates, which is quite astonishing. And that draws down a federal component. So really it's over $330 million between state and federal dollars that are going into Montana's Medicaid system, um, which really I cannot, it, it cannot be overstated. 
is night, a night and day difference uh, for providers who have typically been been um, subsiding on very little. Uh, two quick questions, Eric, what's the cat's name? And also, um, did anything pass that would promote affordable rental housing or uh, assist renters? I know, Ellis, awesome. maybe you were covering a little bit of this too. We'll start with the cat, because that's easy. He's Roscoe, named after the town, not the governor, because you don't name pets after live politicians, with apologies to the former governor. Um, second, <laughs> thank you for laughing at that. Uh, sec second, housing. So if, if you believe the current governor, um, a lot of the, the pro-construction measures that were passed will eventually help renters. The theory of there is that building more will you know, increase supply, make it harder for landlords to kind of command crazy rents. Um, that's a long-term strategy if it works. Um, and there's, of course, debate over whether that's uh, going to work. Um, as Democrats have pointed out, there really isn't a ton in the budget for immediate um, relief for renters. Um, they're, they're, what it, the state has a big budget surplus, as we've touched on a couple times here. So that, that's where the, the money for provider rates is coming from, money for, you know, fixing up the state prison, money for housing, and a bunch of other stuff, too. Um, there's money out of that. It's going to property tax rebates for homeowners, but not for people who rent and pay their property taxes through their rent check. And that was a, a sore spot for Democrats um, throughout the session. Um, so in, in short, um, it, there, there are efforts coming out of the ledge that there are that culture, the, there is money to go to help build, you know, capitally affordable rent restricted housing too. But again, longer term time frame there was it takes a while to build stuff. Um, but no short-term rental assistance, if, that, if that's what that questioner is looking for there. Um, and if someone can address this one quickly, or if a couple of you can jump in, what is the number one unresolved issue that will simmer for the next two years? Just a quick explanation of that, and we'll move on. Anyone want to dive into that? I don't, I don't know that this is the number one issue, but something that's going to be super interesting to watch over the next two years is, is two bills that passed that will allow for the creation of charter schools in Montana. They're two different bills. We don't know which one is, um, I mean, some people say they can survive together, but the, the Senate Majority Leader, Steve Fitzpatrick, who we've talked about, has said that they will definitely be challenged in the courts. Um, Montana is one of only a handful of states that doesn't have charter schools. So I think it's really unclear if those bills will, will survive court challenge, if we will now have charter schools in Montana, which would be a pretty big change um, in, in how those will play out. I don't know if that's the biggest issue, but that's the first one that comes to mind. I'll jump in with my two cents. I think it's Warm Springs, the state hospital. Um, holy moly, there is a lot to figure out with what's going on at that facility and really how it functions in the broader landscape of treatment providers for mental health um, and and people with all all types of needs that are not being treated at the community level. Um, some bills to reform Warm Springs get patients with um, dementia, Alzheimer's, and traumatic brain injuries out of Warm Springs to be treated at the community level um, very well might be vetoed by the governor because of some disagreements over how that transition would happen. That was one of the bills that came back at the 11th hour with an amendatory veto that couldn't be acted on at that time because the Senate had, had already left. So we're not really sure what the governor is actually gonna do with that. And I think um, more so it's really a funding question and a leadership question for the executive branch about whether or not that facility can stabilize and um, get back some of the federal accreditation that it's lost over the last couple of years. It's about time to wrap up. Um, final question for reporters in the remaining uh, couple minutes we have. If people want to follow all the issues you've talked about, um, you know, keep up with state policy, engage with Montana politics, what's the best way for them to do that? For the Montana Free Press folks, it's, it's subscribing to our email newsletters. So we, we have a, a weekly Montana lowdown newsletter that goes out. Um, we're, we're talk, we had the capitalized newsletter during session that Aaron ran. We're talking about what that looks like in the interim. And we also have daily newsletters that kind of bundle all the stories we publish, and both daily and weekly, actually. So uh, that's more reliable than social media is now. So just a pitch for that. So, selfishly, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Capitalize, which is sort of my, my baby during session. Um, I saw some people talking about it in, in the chat. We will be continuing capitalized in some form or fashion through the interim. Um, I think our, my sort of premise is that uh, living in Helena is ultimately a statewide affliction that we all have to deal with, regardless of whether or not the session is um, here, is active. So there's going to be, I think, more news 
about the capital, its characters, and other kinds of political machinations in the state from capitalize moving forward this interim. Oh, so you look like you're about to say something. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say you can just turn on the radio and hear what Shaley and I are up to. We broadcast um, throughout mo much of the state and YPR broadcasts through the other half. So you can almost always catch us on the airwaves. We've got some new towers coming up this summer in some more rural spots. So you can keep an ear out for us. And we also have a website. Shout out to Josh, who I think has been hanging out in the chat, um, who keeps our website up and running. So you can also catch up with us online, too. For other uh, political analysis, MTPR also offers Capital Talk, hosted by Sally Mock, um, and uh, other podcasts as well. I think that's it. That's the wrap on the session. Thank you for those who joined us this evening and submitted questions, and those who have uh, supported our work make uh, our jobs possible. And thanks to all of you, the reporters who who joined us and actually you know made all of this possible. You guys put in a lot of hours, uh, early mornings, late nights. So thank you all and. Uh, have a good night. Pay our salaries, donate. And thank you for those of you who did.